Hello and welcome to um, our Practice as Research seminar series. Um, it is December, um, but this is um, the, the talk that we were actually expecting for October. Unfortunately, our speaker um, had COVID back then and we had to, to postpone the session, but Nonetheless, um, we are here and so is Professor Kate Wall and I'm really excited about that. Um, today we're going to be hearing all about ethics and ethical considerations in practitioner research. Um, Professor Wall's work focuses on the development of pedagogies and research methodologies, um, specifically those that facilitate effective talk about learning, so it's all about metacognition. She has worked extensively in partnership with teachers of all, you know, children of all ages and stages using practitioner inquiry approaches. And that's really why I was actually bugging Kate um, quite a few months ago to say, could you please talk? Because I had come across her work in that in that regard. Um, she's also got a particular sort of interest in um, how visual approaches can facilitate voice. Um, with young children and she explores asking children their opinion and their contributions in appropriate ways. So um, looking at how knowledge is generated um, in terms of, you know, in, in, in research, um, Kate's also interested in ethical practice for eliciting voice within a democratic community. And to this end, she always looks to um, creative methods and practices um, for supporting the level of participation and ensuring authentic voice. Um, as I said, um, quite a few months ago, I approached Kate and I said, well, we have got this practice as research network um, where there are many, many different kinds of practitioners. Some of them are teachers, but not everybody. Um, and would you be able to talk about ethics and ethical um, considerations in, in that kind of um, idea of practitioner research? So um, with that, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm so pleased to have you here, Kate. Um, and, and I'd like to hand over to you just to say I'm going to mute myself so that there are no feedback and, and, and you know, odd noises. Um, but I am here. So if you need anything from me, just let me know. OK, thank you. Um, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling some pressure now <laughs> after that um, welcome. So um, thank you for having me. Um, it's really appreciated. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so what I'm hoping to do this morning is um, to talk a bit um, about what I think practitioner inquiry is. So, um, and I am distinguishing that slightly from practitioner research. Um, it is often associated with education. I am a primary teacher by background, um, but I think I particularly don't use the word teacher because I think it can be applied elsewhere. Um, I've worked with lawyers, I've worked with dentists, I've worked with um, artists, I've worked with uh, social workers, um, early years practitioners, so a range of different type of practitioners. So I think it's really important that um, I, I'm not locating it particularly in teaching, although I think there are some particular dilemmas that emerge in, with those practitioners who are working um, with, with small people, <laughs> with children um, around ethics particularly. And, and so those will come up. So what I thought it'd be he helpful to do, first of all, is just to give some information about what I think practitioner inquiry is, because I think a lot of the ethical dilemmas that we might come across come from um, the particular um, realm of, of what I'm proposing. So practitioner inquiry is, is professional learning, first and foremost. Um, it is about practitioners engaging with their practice and striving to understand better what is going on in in their setting in their context in their work um and i think we we, we sometimes overemphasize the research bit and and underplay the professional learning bit but actually those two things are um equally important um and and the dynamic between them might change over time it is about addressing student need. All of the research around professional learning says that if in, in, in teaching and education, that if it's if you're doing professional learning that's not about addressing children's need as, as perceived in your classroom, then it is not going to be as effective. So it is about addressing um, the, the needs of the learners in, in the care and, and therefore improving educational outcomes. 
Now, this is the first place where one of the dilemmas, I think, and we can argue whether it's ethical or not, occurs. So when I say educational outcomes, lots of people presume that that is attainment and exam results. But I think within the practitioner inquiry realm, we need to open that up and think about educational outcomes in a much broader sense. Happier children, um, health and well-being, um, children who have metacognitive ability, um, children who and, and learners for whom are going to be able to participate in society in an effective way. That could be economic or that could be um, democratic citizens. I think we need to problematize that. And I do think there is an ethical element to the fact that there are lots of presumptions that are placed on research in education that it's all about attainment, because I don't think it is, or I don't think it should be. Um, I think that practitioner inquiry is about supporting practitioners in understanding um, their practice, their, their, their intent, and gaining better knowledge of what's going on. This should give help to give them voice. So one of the things that Nicole said that I'm interested in is voice. Um, I started off interested in children's voice, but what I've become very aware of is if we want children to have a voice, then we need practitioners to have a voice. And I think practitioner inquiry is one way of giving practitioners a voice, because if we don't have practitioners with voice, then they will only go so far in giving young people a voice. We need, to, there's a mirror effect and it's catalytic. Um, it's about teachers and practitioners being reflective, able to think back on what's happened and what's worked and what's not worked, and strategically about what will I do next in the future. And if you look at the work of Portillo and Medina, if this is the kind of thing that floats your boat, then they talk about that as, a, a, as teachers' met metacognition about learning, about their own learning and about the learning of the children in their care. And I think that that again, is a productive mirror effect. If we want children to be metacognitive, and we do, it raises attainment, it's quite a secure research finding, then we want teachers to be metacognitive. There is another productive mirror effect, and there's a lot of mirror effects I, I see in this work with teachers and teacher learning and what we want with kids. Um, and there is a foundation for dialogue, dialogue with colleagues, dialogue with um, learners, um, with researchers, and with policymakers. And again, that's about giving teachers confidence in what they do and why they do it, but also um, in, in, in having some worth in that wider dialogue. Research shouldn't be done to teachers from the university side. It should be something that is um, that teachers are aware of and able to engage in, and, and, and researchers should see the value of their perspective, which has insight and access ethics that we as researchers wouldn't have. I often say to teachers undertaking their doctorates with me that if I did that same research in your setting, I would get a very different response or get a different outcome. Your, don't apologize for your embeddedness, for your perspective. It is of value and it is insightful in a way that I could never be, despite all my experience um, working in schools. So, <laughs> Fundamentally, I do think that if we're going to focus in on the ethics of this, that there is an ethical prerogative that um, to inquire, for practitioners to inquire. And if you look at the work of Grant, um, Susan Granwater smith and Nicole Mockler in, in Australia, then they've written quite a lot on this ethical strive to improve, to understand better, to, to engage with practice in this, in this questioning, sceptical way. Um, I think that it's not just about practice, it's also about the, the different policies and pressures that come from outside. We also need to have a level of professional scepticism about some of those pressures, about some of those pushes that come from out with the school setting or the education system and be, and be ethically Skeptical, skeptical about those. We need to have this questioning stance. And I think research is helpful in, in giving a level of, um, I suppose it's a, a level of leverage around that, that skepticism. It, it gives, it, it 
enables teachers to take risks. It enables them to have confidence and to to assess with their with the power of their perspective. But uh, but fundamentally, what I'm talking about is something that is ethical in its activity. Teachers who don't strive to improve, and there's very few of them who don't want the best for their learners. That that that's unethical, unprofessional, and and I think, you know, one of the the things I'm going to be talking about is this balance between what is professional and what is research. You know, where where is the, where is that ethical element located? Um, and and I think within a practitioner inquiry stance, we may need to make a bridge between the the pedagogical and the methodological. So for me, practitioner inquiry is a, a cyclical thing. It's iterative, it's cumulative over time. Um, I like the work of Lawrence Stenhouse. He talks about systematic inquiry made public. And so we often talk about how to, so if, so if I think practitioner inquiry is, is fundamental in good teaching, and I do, and I shout about it to anyone who will listen that I think all teachers should be doing practitioner inquiry. Now, if I believe that's the case, then ethically, I and the system have to make practitioner inquiry doable because it's not OK. It's unethical for practitioner inquiry to be something that is done outside of their school time, because it is unethical for us to put this requirement onto teachers and practitioners that says you need to be spending your Sunday afternoons doing practitioner inquiry. So we've got to find a way ethically, I do believe, to make this doable and to make this manageable. And, and we often talk about Dolly Parton's rule, it's got to fit in the nine to five. And so if it's, and I say to teachers, if it's if it's happening out with that time and you're not enjoying it, then you need to scale it back. You need to find a way of making it more doable. And I've got hours of presentations looking at ways of doing that. Um, and if you're interested, I do a tweet of the week every Wednesday. I haven't done it today um, around how to make it doable and how to make it um, manageable within the nine to five different types of strategies for evidence different types of strategies for types of question um looking at yeah, don't, yeah anyway. but one of the first ways we do that is to think about plan do review so when um practitioners are tra training in education they are inducted into the plan do review cycle of lesson planning so you plan a lesson you do a lesson you review a lesson it's something that we're all inducted into from the very start over time, it becomes more implicit in our practice, but it's something that most teachers are aware of. So we start with that. We overlay it onto an iterative um, research cycle and say, actually, it's very similar. The two things we're asking teachers to do extra, I suppose, on top of that plan do review is to systematically collect some evidence and to make the findings public in line with Lawrence Stenhouse's um, phrase. Now, these two things can be overwhelming for teachers and can bring them into um, quite heavy university-fied research domains. But again, I think it's part of my ethical prerogative to make practitioner inquiry doable. So I need to challenge thinking on those both those aspects. There's no requirement that they write a 6,000 word essay, for example, on their, six, on their practitioner inquiry. There's no requirement that they share beyond the teacher in the classroom next door. But there are pressures that mean that that sometimes fills the need. In terms of practitioner inquiry, then there's two aspects to it. And if you look at the work of Philip Accordingly and Elaine Hall, they talk about engaging in and with research. So inquiry is the process of engaging with the literature, the field of literature, um, and the process of actually doing a piece of research. And what you find is those two things work in a synergy. Um, dominant ideologies and presumptions about what is research means that lots of teachers presume it's all about doing and in um, and forget about the need to read. They also feel that the only things they should be reading are peer reviewed articles, whereas actually we're talking about a professional community of researchers doing and, and so having value and placing import on what other teachers are doing as well as what academics are doing is is really um about making this community of inquirers a, a rich um space to be there are all these tensions and pressures acting on teachers about what they think is proper research that i have to challenge and 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 help to make it doable there's in scotland practitioner inquiry underpins our professional learning model 
for teachers. And so there is huge amounts of practitioner inquiry out there in the public domain via Twitter, Pinterest, Education Scotland, and yet they ignore it because it's not proper. I've got to go look at peer reviewed articles because that's the clever people. And that puts a whole level of pressure on them. We need to, to show value in the voice of teachers doing this kind of work. And, and, and a lot of these pressures that I'm talking about come from the dominant language of research. I've, this is from the top of my head, but I think the pandemic and one of the successes of the pandemic, um, this is my visual research methods um, brain, is the, the way that research evidence has been communicated in a popular access media way. So findings of research have been communicated visually in a, in a way that they never have been before. Research has been accessed by populations that would never have accessed research findings before. I think that's great. One of the issues is it's only one kind of research. Now, I don't want people testing vaccines in any other type of research. That's important that it's done in, a, in an experimental control group way. But for teachers engaged in practitioner inquiry, then it's knowing there are other types of research out there that is one type, there is a there is a massive pressure and dominant language of research that is impacting on what practitioners think means it means to do research. It's gold standard research, it's scientific, it's um, assumptions about quasi-experimental, the work of John Hattie and the Education Endowment Foundation are all pushing certain models of research onto teachers. And yet if you are positioned in practice, they are almost impossible to do. If you're positioned in real life, they're almost impossible to do. So I see a lot of practitioner inquirers doing um, research that is setting them up to fail, I would argue, because it's setting them up thinking about control groups, pre and post test, a type of research that that's really challenging if you are based in the middle of the of the of the setting of the of the research space so one of the things we need to get more confident about in practitioner inquiry is the positioning of the teacher researcher of the practitioner researcher we can't put on that metaphorical white coat of an experimental scientist that's that's impossible we have biases we're embedded in the setting we're a variable all on our own <laughs> that we have to just embrace the fact that we we are impacting and we are changing our experimental setting as we go and and we can't stop that we don't want to stop it it's unethical for the research to take over from our practice as teachers our first and foremost job is to achieve the best outcomes for the children in our care. If the research is not working, we will stop. As a researcher, if the research is not working, that's interesting in itself. But as a practitioner, our jobs, our professional role has to come first. And we have to celebrate what we have that other researchers wouldn't have. We have relationships, we have access, we have knowledge of the setting, of the challenges within it, and we have insight. And, 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 and maybe we need to get better at shouting about those positives than we do um, about the negatives. We're so busy putting ourselves down. Oh, it's just mini me, or it's just what I think, or it's just a bit of, you know, playing at research. Just stop it, stop it. <laughs> it's not lesser, it is, it is equivalent. I have doctorate students doing practitioner inquiry. Um, it is a different type of lens, but it's equally of value. So we need to build this bridge between pedagogy and methodology. And, and, I, and I think this is at all levels of the research process. And if you're interested in this, I can send you an article that I've written um, about this in the Scottish Education Review. Um, I, I think that this bridge works at every level. Um, I, I was a teacher. I came out of teaching and felt like I had to put all my teaching knowledge off to one side and learn this whole new world of research. But actually my renown in visual methods, um, my expertise in visual methods comes from my teacher brain. 
So my teacher brain said that if I need to be talking to young children about what they think, I would not use reading and writing because that turns a big group of kids off. Um, and I would need to think pedagogically creatively about how I would access those children's beliefs. I would do it through role play. I would do it through physical activity. I would do it through thinking skills activities that are about, there's all sorts of, in my pedagogic repertoire, I have a huge number of activities and tools at my fingertips that I can use to support kids um, expression. But suddenly when I'm doing research, I think I have to put that all to one side because I don't know. And research is the clever people's thing that I need to engage with. When I talk to our, um, our BA students about research, when they're doing their dissertation, I talk about banning the questionnaire. They have this assumption that to be proper, they're doing a questionnaire um, and, and questionnaires are hard. I did a two week course on questionnaires and came away thinking they're too hard. I'm never doing one of those. <laughs> um, so, and yet all these teachers think that they have to do a questionnaire for it to be proper. Um, and doing a questionnaire means you have to design it on a Sunday afternoon. So that's that's equally not problematic. So let's yeah ban the questionnaire. There are all sorts of ways you can do this and, and that's fitting. I need to write a blog based on teachers' knowledge of assessment. Um, teachers have huge knowledge of assessment. They have a repertoire of techniques. And actually those techniques are really powerful for practitioner inquiry. Um, formative, in, um, informal, Summative, uh, yeah, there's the, yeah. But, but I suppose in this presentation, you, you've got me off at a tangent. What's interesting here is the bridge between research ethics and professional ethics. Um, because I think that there we have um, some potential conflicts that we have to try and find a way through within a, when we're doing practitioner inquiry. So I've got on this slide some areas that I think are bring ethical tension. Do you see the water tension picture? See what I did there? Uh, anyway, um, I think that we need to be much more aware of the relationships and what is a research relationship and what is a teaching relationship and, um, and how those two come together. I think there's something really interesting there. And power is a really important thing to recognize and, 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 and acknowledge. I don't think we can get away from power in a school. You know, the adults have power, the children do not. I have a colleague who talks about the fact that children in schools have about as much power as prisoners. Now that's quite a shocking way to put it, but it's true. In the, at a certain point, teachers can make children do all sorts of things um, and, with, and relatively unthinkingly. Um, we have to be really aware where and transparent about that. Um, I think that we also need to be aware that there are hierarchies within the children. It's not just about adults and children, it's about within the children, those hierarchies of power within um, each class, within each year group, across the school, and we need to acknowledge those and again use our pedagogical brains to think about the techniques that may be um, play with those power dynamics or try and lessen them in some way, shape or form. Um, I think we have to be aware of inclusivity. Teachers should be inclusive. Inclusive is a word that we are um, often playing with and, and, and needing to be um, acknowledging and, um, and, and, and put into practice. But because we're doing research, we need to make sure that those same inclusive principles are um, underpinning. And it's not just about inclusive of children. Um, we often think about inclusive, inclusivity of, of different types of children, different ethnic, different culture. Um, it's also about inclusivity of views that maybe don't agree with your own, inclusivity of um, marginalized opinions. Um, you've got the power as a teacher to close things down or open things up. How do you deal with agreement and disagreement with yourself or within the classroom setting. I think that's a really important, and it links to power, um, but, but how do you create a space? And again, this bridges 
research and pedagogy. How do you create a space where it's safe to say something that other people don't believe? Now, one of the places that's most pertinent is in staff rooms. How easy is it in a staff room to say something that is alternate to what everybody else in the, in the staff room, particularly if you are a relatively new teacher or novice in the, in the, in the community? Because those relationships, those power dynamics, that inclusivity works with the staff in the same way as it does with the children. And, and we need to acknowledge that. It doesn't all go away. In fact, if there's anything that's worse in the staff room than it is in the school, we spend less time thinking about it. We need to think about access. Um, we take for granted the access we have um, and often don't see the possibilities of the access we might have, particularly into communities um, and beyond the school gates. We need to think about the consent and assent processes around that and particularly how the gatekeeping that might go on. Um, I, a lot of my work at the moment is um, around voice with children from birth to seven. And, and that's because those children are often excluded because adults make decisions about them not being capable, um, not having a voice, not having a, a perspective to give. Um, so so uh, gatekeeping and consent is something I'm really aware of. Um, and really, and, and anyone that's got a six month old knows that they have a voice, knows that they're very good at making themselves heard. Um, we need to be more and, and be aware of the decisions we're making as adults and, and the gatekeepers around it. There's something about um, what we do with what we hear. Um, I think that's really important. So and protection inquiry is about strategic action. So it's reflective and strategic. So what what do we do as a result of the research and how do we communicate that, particularly to children who have less power than us? How do we codify and check whether that action makes sense and is associated with, with what we've actually found. It's sense-making. Um, and that links to how we share and the community, the professional community around which within which we're working. And I do think that that making public bit is a lot, is a really significant part of the ethical process that goes on in practitioner inquiry. You've got to share up process and outcomes um, and I've written a bit about ethics being, um, particularly research ethics, being much more about outcome and about making sure that we're we're accountable and um, and checking that safeguarding. It's, it's about outcomes, but actually, in this kind of research, the ethics is about process as equally important. Um, time is really important. Anyone who has any conversations with teachers knows that time is precious, particularly this time of year. Um, but but always and so the ethics of taking up your own time or me asking you to use up your time the ethics of taking up other people's time um if you're teaching in exam year groups when time and curriculum are massively pressured that's something you really have to think of. time is a big thing and 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 the ethics of research taking up some of that time pedagogical time professional time is is something that we have to put out there um Two at the bottom, the last two. So children's rights perspective. So in Scotland, the UNCRC is um, very explicit in our um, education policy and curriculum. So um, you, Article 12 and 13, but across the board, um, UNCRC is, is fundamental. So to what extent does our practitioner fit in with the UNCRC and, and, and the, the rights that are embedded in it? I think that it links to power, it links to relationship, it links to inclusivity, um, and, and we need to be aware of, of that. Um, I would be, it's interesting to talk to people in England where it's not as explicit in policy and curriculum as to what it looks like, and that varies quite a lot across schools. Um, I'm going to go onto that partition, practitioner inquiry for credit with the next slide, but um, the, the one thing that I think that we have to engage with as an ethical consideration that's not there in the research ethics, but is there in the pedagogical professional ethics is about pedagogical appropriateness. And I've written a beer, a blog on that, and I'll put it in the chat if I remember in a bit. So I think that we need to have an additional judgment of quality in practitioner research or education research more generally, if I'm honest, but particularly in practitioner research about what's pedagogically appropriate in this setting to do. Um, 
if you're working with three-year-olds, then what's pedagogically appropriate would be very different to what you would do with nine-year-olds. Um, it's not okay to put the same research assumptions onto into both those settings. Um, if you are a class where you're doing philosophical inquiry naturally and part of pedagogy, then that has good fit and pedagogically appropriate. With the same year group and a teacher that doesn't do philosophical inquiry, then to do philosophical inquiry just for the sake of your research is problematic because it will be out with the, com the comfort zone of the children and probably the teacher. We need to have a, an engagement around that. So I wanted to finish really with this dilemma. Um, so this is a dilemma that I'm actually dealing with at the moment. So I run all the doctorates in the School of Education at the University of Strathclyde. 70% um, of our doctorate students are full-time practitioners across different types of settings, um, universities, FE colleges, schools, special schools and nurseries. Um, and this is a teacher that emailed me over the weekend. So this is a teacher who regularly undertakes um, children's voice work in her classroom um, in line with the US UNCRC. She thinks that's really important that children have decision making powers about different things that are happening to them. She's just started the EDD um, and is doing the modules that help her to develop her proposal. Um, and she wants to talk to children as part of developing that proposal. Now, she won't go through formal ethics until after the proposal is confirmed and she knows what to write on the ethics form. But she's not going to know what to write on the ethics form until she's talked to the children because she wants them to have a say in it. Any thoughts? Because we've not solved it at the moment. So this is one of the, the ethical dilemmas of these kind of crossing over. If she wasn't doing the doctorate, she could talk to those kids without batting an eyelid because it would be part of her normal practice. But because she's doing the doctorate, it adds another level of accountability because she's doing it for credit. Um, and so any questions after that? And I think there's, the chat's gone mad. So um, I'll let Nicole um, help. If I, I can go back to some of those slides, if that's helpful. Thank you very much, Kate. So first of all, a round of applause. Um, it's, it's just me at the moment, but, but other people are applauding as well, virtually and really. Um, so thank you very much. And um, um, I have got a couple of comments and a couple of questions. And, and you know, so obviously I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the hot seat here in the way because I have got the, the advantage of, of, of regulating what's going to come next. <laughs> so um, I'm taking that... Um, um, prerogative here now to kind of say that dilemma that you're saying is um, there's somebody you know I have the same dilemma working with people with autism there's somebody else saying actually this is one of my favorite dilemmas that I'm, I'm constantly encountering um you know we have the same issue here at, at my university at University College London um I'm head of research ethics in the Institute of Education and and I encounter that all the time so how we manage it just as, a, as an idea how we manage it is that we recommend that people apply for an ethics part where they are literally just asking to go into the classroom um you know to kind of develop those things together and once they've got the, the proposal they will then apply for the second stage so a lot of the time if you think about grant funders as well they have got work packages and you may know what work package one looks like but you don't necessarily know what work package two looks like so we're doing the same process for everybody and we are allowing people to say well on this occasion i only want ethical approval to be going into the class classroom to be talking to the children to help me develop the, my proposal and once I've got that clear I will apply for this for the for the for the full proposal if you like um but obviously it does put pressure on on resources on people because you need people to 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 read and to to approve and all of the rest of it so it's and, not, and this, going and this, back to the point that you've made about time you know it's not a, an ethical use of time I totally agree with that but that's how we are managing it at the moment yeah, no, it's 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 it, the big thing is our ethics form is so clunky and chunky <laughs> um, that it almost yes. is it's an inhibitor in itself. And ethic, what's 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 important to recognise is that the the size of that form actually puts people off asking children. So one of the emails that she sent in this dialogue was maybe I'll just not talk to the children because it's that it's like no, because no, that's good. You know, don't not do it because it's yeah. yeah. 
but as her but as her degree program director as her course leader for her to start filling in the ethics form to just to do this at this point will detract her from the other things I need her to do for the modules that she's doing yeah it's 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 not it's, there's no win and in fact our ethics committee are being quite sensitive and saying you've talked to us about it we've seen the email exchanges we're at the minute we're okay with doing you doing what you're doing so they've been quite understanding but um yeah it was it's it's not easy at all and this crossover is full of of yeah tensions thank you so i've got a couple of um comments here um one question does she have to study her own class maybe children outside of her class um but that could be me thinking as a researcher you know like what you said you know separating the practitioner from the researcher um, somebody else saying, I lead a master action research module and have introduced a reconnaissance phase that allows for ethics applications before the proposal for action. So it's a similar process to what we have got here. That's kind of two staged approach. I, I, um, I did wonder whether I could do a, um, a modular ethics form. So for yes. um, I, I do a master's module where they have to do a piece of um, practitioner inquiry on a very small scale. They don't have to complete ethics for that because I've got a mod modular approval. Um, and so I did wonder as part of the ND module she's doing whether I could do a module approval for people who wanted to explore ethics. But at the minute, I haven't got the time to do that either. So, um, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's another option that we are also playing around with at the moment, to be honest, in my department, in my, in my area, um, in terms of, you know, like a modular ethics approach. Um, can I just say there were um, a couple of specific questions that were put to me and then I've got um, one hand up as well. So if I just may put, you know, those two questions to you and then the, th the, the hand up. Um, the first one was, um, you were talking earlier about the repertoire of pedagogical tools and pedagogical activities that are available to you. Um, and somebody asked, is there anywhere where we can find this repertoire? Now, I did say, um, you know, to that person, actually, the activities that you mentioned, you do tweet about, but is there anywhere where you may have like a, um, a you know, a, a book or, or any kind of resources that you could possibly share, perhaps? Yeah, so, so when I'm talking about um, pedagogical repertoire, I'm, I'm almost talking in an informal way, like as teachers learn to teach, you build up. So Robin Alexander talks about the difference between recipes and repertoire and, and, and about all, how all teachers have a repertoire of techniques informally in their brain, um, as well as um, formally in different resources that they might have uh, on their computer or within the staff room we build up this repertoire of techniques so in it's in a broad sense that's what i'm meaning that that and all of us who teach in some way shape or form whether it's in the university or in school have these this this repertoire of techniques um but i recognize and and one of the, but i recognize the need to formalize that and to induct people which is why i do that tweet of the week and um, i was part of the northeast thinking skills center at newcastle university in the early 2000s and I found that thinking skills techniques are really productive spaces. Um, so thinking skills techniques have the characteristic that they're relatively open, that they're about concept elicitation. Um, so they can include things like diamond nines, the idea that you can have nine things and order them into a diamond. It's a survey technique. Um, so what we did, what Elaine and I did in this book, so I don't know if you can see that, Research Methods for Understanding Professional Learning, um, and in there, in the centre of that book, there are 18 tools, 16 tools, 18 tools, can't remember. Um, some of which come from pedagogy and some of which come from research, 18 tools. And we try and talk about how they come into a practitioner inquiry frame and can be used um, to support pedagogy and research simultaneously. And each one of those has um, at least two or three or four examples of practitioners using them. So there are many case studies within those of, of practitioner inquirers using that tool. Um, it includes things like art based methodologies. It includes um, puppets and drama. It includes students as researchers, diamond ranking, fortune lines, cartoon story boards, as well as things like surveys, um, experimental design. Um, so hopefully there's one to suit everyone. And we talk about that like a sweet shop of, of 
of a, a pick and mix you can choose what you want <laughs> and, and then adapt it with the permission that goes with thank you very much thank you very much kate that's great um Leda, do you want to come in at this stage thank you nicole uh, first of all i would like to thank you so much for this talk i don't normally say inspiring but it you, you gave us a lot there to think about thank you so much and um, so i i made the comment about my, the dilemma between having a researcher hat or a practitioner hat and what do you do when you have both hats on at the same time and you try to <clears throat> sometimes you have to bracket or hold yourself from remind yourself now i'm in a researcher role or now i'm in a practitioner role so uh, my experience, uh, it's been frustrating for me in the past with my researcher hat on when, for example, uh, I've done participatory evaluation research, and uh, that was to do with clinical intervention in, and educational interventions. But I remember the practitioners getting impatient with me because there were things happening and they 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 thought that this could be used as evidence that the intervention works and that i, I should be collecting that mm -hmm. but uh, with my researcher hat on i could not if people hadn't signed consent forms i couldn't collect anything uh, re relating to participants so i started thinking about that years ago how easy it is if you're a practitioner at some point they, they were so impatient with me they started their own evaluation and they were collecting so much data without any ethics approval so I, do, I don't have a solution to this. I just think this is such an interesting tension. And I wonder how your student is going to resolve it, working with her own class and whether you know she can stop herself if ethics approval hasn't actually, do you see what I mean? Yeah, um, and I think that that's where that, that, that tension around doing research for credit um, is, is, is critical. So um, I would say that that, so, so as I said, 70% of our, our doctorate students are part time. So working full time in schools of, or, or education settings of some form or other. And um, they have they can only support in their dissertation, in their thesis, the stuff that they have ethical approval for. That doesn't stop them doing other stuff. And they and there they would be covered by professional ethics. And there they would be covered by the, the, the hierarchy and, and management systems of the school. Um, child protection, um, high, you know, line managers, we have to presume that those are in place, that if they were doing something that was out with professional ethics in collecting that data, then there would be a system. But it's not for us as a university to check that. What we can only check is what goes into the, the thesis itself. <clears throat> I think where it becomes a bit more blurred is when I'm working informally and not for credit with teachers to do practitioner inquiry so i do a lot of work coaching teachers through the process of of, of practitioner inquiry of doing research and they're they're not doing it for credit they're doing it for their professional learning and um, ethics becomes somewhat squashed out because i don't have to um answer to the university in the same way they don't they certainly don't have to answer to, to the university professional ethics is therefore much higher in the list of, of things that are important. I still talk about consent. I still talk about assent. I still talk about some of the ethical dilemmas around randomized control trials, for example. And, and, you know, the idea that if you found this pedagogy that works and you think works, why wouldn't you give it to everybody else? Um, the thing I often say to the teachers is if this was a kid of yours, how would you feel? So if you were doing that, you know, the kid in the class next door is getting this thing that's meant to be amazing and your kid isn't, how do you explain that? Could you explain it? If you can't, then you've got, it's problematic to do it in that way. And I think that one of the intake, it, it is that that one foot in, in both camps. So for a practitioner inquirer, and I would identify myself as a practitioner inquirer, although I'm not in school, I am still a teacher and I teach all the time. Um, I need to have that balancing act, that bridge constantly in my mind around how would the university see it, but also what would my professional ethics see it? And, and, and rather than having a researcher hat on and a teacher hat on or a practitioner hat on, I need to wear both hats together and, and be able to articulate clearly my thinking about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. 
And that's hard, but we need the professional community and the practitioner inquiry community to be validating and checking and be critically friendly around that process of trying things out and sense making. I wrote a paper for the um, uh, teacher education encyclopedia, I think the encyclopedia of teacher education, um, which where I took principles of voice that we developed with children and applied them to the staff room for practitioner inquiry. Because I think we need to think really carefully about how we create brave spaces which are doing that ethical checking in a professional zone and a research zone because that's where it happens it's in that professional space thank you very much Kate thank, thank you. you I have got a hand up from Donna Donna may I ask you to come in yeah yes yeah, certainly so so I thankfully not researching children so I work in the NHS um but I I, I just really really just endorse some of the things you're saying I'm getting really frustrated that I so I work full-time the NHS in a managerial role and doing a part-time PhD and I'm constantly being asked well are you being a researcher or you being a practitioner I keep going no I'm, I'm being me I'm both I cut it's like saying you know I'm a northerner or I'm a woman I'm both um and that's usually the reply I give and I think so I've started to put silly little techniques which just think respond to what you're saying is I need to I need to be I need to live to my own conscience, which which kind of grapples with all of this. Mm -hmm. So um, in the NHS, we've got something called the uh, Nolan Principles, where you have to declare what any public interests. So I've declared it all in that form. And I've got an email word in my NHS email that puts at the bottom that says what I'm doing in the university. And then in my university email, I've got my NHS world. And then so that I'm never saying I'm just one because I'm both. And the power is being both. Um, but it so just thank you. It, it's kind of given me confidence that maybe I'm not as mad as as I thought. When I started off, so I'm two years in, I had two different desks in the house. So I would be a researcher in one part of the house <laughs> and then I would do my NHS up here. So but that's kind of started that that was my I had to keep them separate. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm sitting at my NHS desk doing listening to you. So that's gone out of the pot now. It depends on the day. Um good for you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you. I think that the, one of the interesting one of the interesting things, if I can just respond to that, is the fact that once you put that hat on, which is both, you realise how many of the research textbooks are written for researchers. Then, And there are research books, books written for practitioners, but there aren't research books written for both. And so there is the need to, to find them. And that's what we tried to do in that book. We tried to write it for both, for both um, and, and try to embrace the fact that we are both and we're trying to be both. Um, I think the other thing is recognizing that if you're going to follow this through, reflexivity becomes really important. So the 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 voice, the reflexive voice that is underpinning your study, your research, because people don't get it, they don't understand it, it becomes really important. And I've equated that to teacher metacognition in practitioner inquiry. So I think reflexivity in a research realm is metacognition in a teacher realm. So in that bridge of, of, of methodology and pedagogy, we, that it's that reflective and strategic thinking. Well, that's reflexivity, but it's metacognition. Um, and, and so that becomes really important. So, and the consequence of that is you might need to think differently about what your thesis looks like because you've got to flag up that and it's got to have a different structure. And so all those presumptions about a thesis being introduction, lit review, methodology, results, discussion, conclusion need to just go <laughs> just chuck them out and you need to be brave about structuring it in a different way and, and a lot of my students are putting for example um epistemology and, and ontology in the first chapter it's one of the first things you read because it's about positioning themselves in relation to the research just to put it in methods is is artificial because it's about everything <laughs> but yeah be brave go for it Thank you very much. Thank you. So I've got one last comment from Sarah. Sarah, do you want to come in now? I think you're on, you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's just that there's a, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's just that there's a project in, in Birmingham um, which focuses on babies, very young babies and voice and about that completely unexplored area, but I can send the details that they've got a, an online presence. There's a whole lot of information online. 
we've we've done so our work is look who's talking um and i'll put the link to our work with babies and you can maybe make a connection um so we've got a website for our work thank you thank you very much so um can i just say very 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 quickly thank you so much kate for this really really inspiring and, and exciting talk um there is so much more i didn't even get to ask my questions i've written them down but i didn't even have time for that um i would like to share the, my screen very quickly to give you a heads up on our next pra um, practice as research seminar which is going it's called still moving ethical considerations in embodied practice and on that occasion we will have um, Dr Sonia York Price from Australia reflecting on ethical considerations within embodied practice and dance research and she herself is obviously a dancer so she's a dancer um, researcher a practitioner in that respect um, and that will be taking place in January so do check out the website um, for details um, also, here are, you know, I'm sharing again um, the details on how you can um, access some of the recordings on the PAR YouTube channel, the Buzzsprout channel, um, the Practice as Research website, but also obviously you can always get in contact with me directly via email. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to say again, thank you so much, Kate. I really, really appreciate the time you've taken today. Um, and I look forward to connecting again in the future. Mm -hmm.